All right, welcome everyone. This is Sean McVeigh. I'm here with Deacon Dennis, St. Joseph Catholic Church, Marion, Iowa. And today we are going to talk about the Sacrament of Holy Orders to help those prepare for the Sacraments of Initiation. So this is a very sacrament-filled discussion here today. So Deacon Dennis, thank you so much for uh, putting together a presentation for us and for your willingness to share on the Sacrament of Holy Orders, uh, which you have personally received. So I really appreciate you sharing on that. And what would you be, what would be some like introductory comments you'd like to make before we get into the presentation? Sure. It's my pleasure to be here. And like Sean said, I, I am ordained a permanent deacon and I've been ordained uh, around seven and a half years now. And this coming year, well, 2021, it will be eight years that I have been ordained. So um, time flies when you're having fun, right? It, it surely does. Yeah. So I've been in the process since 2008. So, yeah. the, you know, the formation goes all the way back to that. And we'll talk about some of the formation as we get into this. But uh, one of the things we were talking about briefly before we uh, started recording was that the sacraments of marriage and holy orders are sometimes lumped together because they are the two sacraments of service. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, talk about sacraments of initiation, sacraments of healing, and these would be the two sacraments of uh, service. So that's why they're sometimes talked about together. Yes, thank you. And um, I haven't gone through the slides super carefully before this conversation, but in, in years past, you gave a presentation with both together. So there might be some wording in here just to alert our viewers. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can kind of take a look at um, this topic here on the slides. So here is the first slide specific to holy orders. So what do you want to share with us in this topic here on this one? Uh, that first bullet point of, of sacrament of apostolic ministry. So apostolic comes from the word apostle. So we believe that it was the apostles that first... Um, you know, began, Jesus chose the apostles, and as time went on, as the church grew, uh, the ministry grew along with it, and the three orders of, uh, or three degrees, as it's noted here, uh, of holy orders was something that they handed down, and it comes directly from them, so a lot of times, you know, we can say that, uh, and, and it's true that if it were traceable, and it probably is, that every bishop in the United States should be able to trace his ordination hmm. back to one of the apostles, which is kind of a cool thing. To me, it always gives the, the that connection between us. Here we are in 2021, all the way back to the earliest beginnings of the church through ordination of bishops. And then subsequently priests and deacons. So uh, hopefully we can talk to that some more. And then also apostolic ministry. Sometimes you'll see the word apostolate, which is nothing more than say a group or some sort of uh, collection of people that are unite, united in themselves or with themselves to draw more people to the church. So that's that whole apostolic ministry. Mm -hmm. That all flows from the apostles. And then um, the three degrees, uh, I mentioned that. So we, and these are terms that you might hear or you might read probably more so. Um, the episcopate, that would be bishops. The presbyterate would be priests. And then diaconate, which is deacons. And there's two types of deacons, uh, transitional and permanent. And we'll talk more about that as time goes on. So, and then that last bullet point, we're ordained to the offices of teaching, sanctifying, and governing. And um, that, that would be sometimes referred to the three munera uh, of uh, holy orders. So teaching, sanctifying, and governing. I myself, uh, I play a role, but there we're talking more so with regard to bishops and priests in terms of the teaching and the, certainly the governing would be left to the to the bishop. Right. And um, so the um, well, I have a question, but you know what? I'm going to actually hold on to it because I think you're going to address it in a little bit. But 
Um, let me just see about um, see here trying to trying to figure out how to advance the slide. Oh, there we go. Um, did can you see this next slide? Okay. So holy orders, holy means the set apart. You've probably heard that um, in some of the other talk about sacraments, you know, holy matrimony, mm. holy, you know, baptism, you know, confirmation. We're, we're called to this basic universal call to holiness and to be set apart. So in the case of holy orders, um, the bullet point there says it goes beyond simple election or designation or delegation or institution by the local community. And what that means is not everyone is called to uh, the priesthood or the diaconate. It really is the church. So uh, in my case, we'll just say it was our priest who um, maybe saw something in me that would be suitable to be a deacon and he brought it to my attention and I said yes to that invitation to go further into uh, you know becoming a deacon but it was ultimately through the church the church is the one the bishop is the one that calls men to orders mm -hmm. uh, whether it's priesthood or the diaconate and uh, so it, it is the church. These sacraments come directly from Christ. Christ is the one who instituted them. And it is through the church that we are ultimately ordained. It's not just someone because maybe they're a good speaker or, you know, they, they have a certain gift for something that would maybe fit well into being a priest or a deacon. But it, it really is a process of the church deciding and there's many things that go into it. You know, the, there's, um, oh, there's all kinds of psychological testing and things that go along with that in terms of readiness to be called to orders. So that, I think that's something that needs to be stressed. Uh, you know, it's, it's just not something you decide to do and then uh, go through the process. So. Yeah, and there's a, there's a discernment dynamic on both sides, the individual and the the churches, like I personally, I went through Catholic school, kindergarten through 12th grade, and in college I had what I call my religious awakening, and here was a young guy who's like going to mass every day and going to prayer groups and trying to really live the Catholic faith, so oh, you're, you're definitely supposed to be a priest, is what the people started telling me, and I'm like, well, I never felt called to it, and I started to like become afraid, like did I miss something? And so I was open to the call if that was my, if that's what God wanted. So I joined a religious order to discern that. And I just prayed and was open. And I just felt like God was saying to me, this, this isn't your calling. Yes. And, um, you know, but outwardly I could live the, the lifestyle, but I didn't feel called to it. And so, um, that was sort of how I concluded. It's like, you know what? I really feel like God has a different calling for me, which was to the marriage vocation. And, um, you know, it was a sense of peace when I, when I came to understand all of that. Like, I, 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 as I mentioned, I was afraid of doing the wrong thing going into it. But I reached a place where I was like, I, I truly believe in good conscience that my, my calling in life is to the marriage vocation. And that was after four years of discernment. Yeah. So it's it's a double, you know, the church is discerning and the individual is discerning. And um, God has a plan for us. He has a plan for my life. That's why I'm sitting here right now trying to teach people the faith. Uh, yeah. But it, it didn't involve holy orders. Yeah. Um, but it's important for all of us to be open to a call. And I've had, you know, people suggest the diaconate to me as well at times. And again, I'm open to that. If God calls me to it, it's, you know, I have four little children. So practically speaking, it, it doesn't work right now because the diaconate is a demanding calling and my little children kind of, I feel need that energy of mine right now. So that would be maybe later on, yeah. but. So, you know, like from, for myself, and I think, you know, thank God you did actually, you know, people saw something in you and, 
you know, you were willing to go through the discernment. So to mm -hmm. me, the process worked correctly. Yeah, it you know, did. The fact that, uh, you know, you went in and you discerned, but yet you really felt strongly that you weren't being called. So to me, that whole discernment yeah. process worked the way the church intended. Yeah. And, you know, and that shows up later on in life, you know, where you're using the gifts, as you said, to yeah. better the church, to grow the church, to grow, to grow the body of Christ. So like in my case, when I was approached about becoming a deacon, um, you know, I took the time to talk it over with my wife and children, and they agreed that that was something that, you know, there could have been a vocation there. So that whole first semester of formation was, it's what was called an inquiry period mm -hmm. where you're in there, you're going through some of the classes that um, might be happening you're exposed to some of the things that deacons do and it's you don't want to get hung up on the doing part of it it's who we are you know mm -hmm. what's what's our being as opposed to doing and that was really stressed early on uh, as we were going through that inquiry period it's not about it's not about what we do a lot of mm -hmm. people preach a lot better than me a lot of people are better servants than me but it was is it something that my gifts through the discernment of the person and the church that we can use uh, right. God's people. Yeah, so um, now for this slide, did we go through the points you wanted to on this one? I think so. Yeah, it really is. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. That second one is the only one. Okay. Uh, it really is a gift from the Holy Spirit, too. Yeah. And um, and the other thing, like you said, the, the, the process worked, and that's so right. And the whole time I went through my discernment, I was noticing the wisdom of the church. Like I joined a religious order. You can't make a, a lifelong commitment for a minimum of five years. You have to be there for five years. And, it, and you really need that time to sift through it all. And I just thought, you know, so many people rush into marriage. If they took the approach that the church is saying as far as really taking the time to spend time discerning, I think a lot more people would be able to come to a better conclusion at times and rather than a, a year or two into it and realize, oh, we made a mistake or whatever. Um, and, and at that point, you're technically committed to it for your life, you know, so but our culture doesn't always stay committed. So this right. next slide that we that we have on the screen is um, so it's comparing the priesthood of the old covenant with the priesthood of the new covenant, and we're in this Hebrew study right now. And the, to me, when I saw this slide again, it, it kind of brought to light what we're actually going through in this scripture yeah. study, and how the old covenant it was foreshadowing the new, that ultimate the the priesthood of Christ, the fulfillment of the old covenant priesthood in Christ. And Christ is the one true priest. And um, any other priest, you know, like Father Dave or whomever, they are ministers of Christ in, in their role as priests in the church. So I, I think that's a, a very beautiful way to put that, you know, as Christ being the one true priest and then uh, ordained priests are ministers of his in the church. Yeah, and you know, last week in our topic you know for the study of hebrews we talked about the priesthood and the priesthood is a pivotal role in all of the jewish religion in the old testament it is the climax of their whole faith was the temple sacrifices and all of the priests did that with that and um that that way of life was god's way of prefiguring what jesus would be and fulfill and we are very lost to that in our current world because with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Jewish religion, as it was in the Old Testament, was destroyed. There is a, a form that they adapted to. We, we call it often rabbinic Judaism, but it is not the Judaism that God uh, ordained, in a sense, in the Old Testament. And the reason why that's significant is we need to go back and say, what? What is God's plan for salvation? And it's based on the priesthood and yes. what that does. And that's kind of like when you when you carry that forward into the New Testament, the new covenant, it's the priesthood 
that brings us the sacraments that initiate us into full communion with God. Yes. You know, yes. so that's what everyone's, for, yeah, people are preparing for in RCIA is the sacraments of initiation. And in this case, it's going to be the parish priest who's going to be bringing those, uh, or, you know, um, making those possible. And that he represents, as you said, the person of Christ and his priesthood in that moment. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all for that. Yeah. So this is something that uh, I think goes back to our discussion on baptism on this next slide. There's two types of priesthood, and we have the common priesthood of believers, and we see uh, in 1 Peter where that's depicted, uh, and when we are baptized, we are baptized priest prophet and king. So our lives in a sense become a sacrifice. So what do priests do? I know that question was asked and um, what do priests do? They offer sacrifice. So as you know, lay people are referred to as being a part of the common priesthood of believers, our lives in a sense, we offer them to God as a sacrifice. And there's so much more we can uh, talk about with that. But again, you see that three munera I mentioned a little bit earlier, that three priest, prophet, and king. And we're just basically sent out to use those gifts that we are given us through our baptism to share uh, in that one priesthood of Christ. And then it's that one last bullet point under that first common priesthood is lay Catholics are intercessors between Christ and the world. That's a role that we shouldn't take lightly as um, something that because of our baptism we're called to do. And then and, the, and just real quick, getting back to that Old Testament prefigurement of the New Testament priesthood. So the, the whole livelihood of the priest or the whole way of life was they offered sacrifice and on behalf of the people. And being that we're baptized as priests, that means that we are a people of, that offers sacrifice. So, you know, we live in a culture that's very me-centered and good feelings centered. And but a priest is one who who sacrifices, and we're not essentially called to be out for looking what makes us feel good. And we need to be prepared to prepared to lay down our life, make sacrifice for the for the good of others. And that's what brings about change. Like there's a depiction of Jesus on the cross behind me here on the wall. And it was through his death on the cross that one of the soldiers who helped to crucify him said, truly, this was the son of God, which is through the sacrifice, it brought about conversion of others. So that's, that's part of what we as lay people need to keep in mind is, is that we do offer sacrifices, not in the same way as the ministerial priesthood that you're about to talk about, but in imitation of it, in a sense, we are to look at how they offer sacrifice and how Jesus offered sacrifice and then say to ourselves, okay, what sacrifices is God calling me to make in my life? How do I lay down my life for others? Yes. You know, yesterday, uh, when we talked about marriage, you know, we use the language. So some of the language that we use in marriage is similar to holy orders and this uh, common priesthood because we talk about being a gift, offering mm -hmm. a gift of ourselves. And I would just throw the word sacrificial gift mm -hmm. of ourselves in there to whether it's our spouse or to the church or just to each other as, as uh, brothers and sisters in yeah. Christ. So I think that's important to remember that that gift of self, whenever we're entering into any kind of vocation, um, it's a it's to be considered a gift. Of yeah. ourselves. So then uh, we have the ministerial priesthood, which is a, there's another term for that, and it's called the hierarchical priesthood. And so those we mentioned, you know, the presbyterate or the Episcopate, presbyterate, and the diaconate, there's that hierarchical structure in the church. Mm -hmm. And we would say that those are in the service of the common priesthood of believers. And that's important to remember. You know, I'm not here for myself. I'm not here to make myself look good. 
I am here to build up and to support um, our lay faithful mm. in growing in their knowledge and love of Christ and his church. I, quite simply, that's it. And I perform that differently than a priest or a bishop. And we'll talk about that as time goes on. Um, so I think, let's see, yeah, that unfolding of baptismal grace again uh, to, to help that grow, to foster that growth, and then ultimately to build up the church. So now we'll talk about the specific um, ordination. So deacon being the first. So every, uh, let's, I guess I'll talk about the transition transitional deacon versus a permanent. So any young man who is ordained into the transitional diaconate simply means that he's going to ultimately transition into becoming a priest. And um, so what that, so in like in the case in our archdiocese, we ordain to the transitional diaconate and then about a year later, they would be ordained into the priesthood. And I honestly don't know if that's the way it's always been throughout the history of the church, but there is some time limit there uh, where they are deacons and then they go out and serve. So a deacon is a deacon, you know, whether it's permanent or transitional, uh, the service is the same. Uh, ultimately, the the type of service that we do to the church is the same. And, and just, to, just to interject, I think part of the purpose for the transitional diaconate is to help these men, you know, grow in the role that they're going to take on. So a deacon is allowed to proclaim the gospel and preach at mass. So by becoming a, a transitional deacon, these young men who are going to be priests can begin to do that liturgically. They're also allowed to do baptisms. So again, that's going to help prepare them for the roles of priests, but they're not going to have all of the load that a priest would have. Right. So it's in some sense, it's giving them an opportunity to grow into or grow toward that role as a priest. And um, I'm sure the church has maybe other reasons, but those would be practical reasons that yeah. would catch my attention right away. Yeah, so there is a practical element to it. And as you said, um, what better way to know the dynamics of a parish is to immerse yourself in that and do the baptisms, meet with couples for marriage. And those are all things transitional deacons do. And they sometimes, well, most times they take on sort of an internship at a parish mm -hmm. to do this. And we had that within the last year with Deacon yeah. Martin being here. And then from the spiritual standpoint, I think it's good to understand the aspect of servant. We are servants and we can't forget that because I think sometimes, you know, maybe a young priest and especially today where they are, there is a heavy workload, you get into the management of the parish and you maybe start to forget why you're ultimately there. Yeah. And I know even for myself, I have to be reminded of that. And um, so it's good to maybe get that mindset of servant as you, uh, as these young men are ordained into the and I, I think another important thing that the primary role of the ordained is, well, I'm thinking mainly right now of priests, especially priests and bishops, but it's to serve the sacraments in a sense, to preach and to give us the sacraments more so than be an administrator. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's ultimately, um, the most important thing uh, for a, a priest or a bishop. And um, seeing a young person come through, like the transitional deacon, can help them remember that if they're getting caught up in the, the busyness of other things. Yes. So it's, it's a benefit to them that way, as you were saying. Absolutely. So, one of the, so look back to the whole part, that first bullet point, mm -hmm. ordained to image the image of Christ the servant. So the word deacon or diaconate actually means servant. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that in itself kind of emphasizes that part of it. And um, I, just to, as a little side note here, sometimes, so every priest is a deacon and every bishop is a priest and a deacon. 
And sometimes you'll see the Pope on um, Holy Thursday when he's washing the feet of people, he will actually take his stole and it mm. will be worn as a deacon wears his. So it'll mm. be off to the side and that sash across the chest is an indicator of that role as a servant. So the Pope will actually take his stole and put it in the position of mm -hmm. uh, the deacon, the servant part of it. So, and, and also I thought of this a minute ago to, you know, alert the people who are watching in the book of Acts, um, the, the apostles were not able to tend to everything. So they they were complaining that the widows and orphans were not being cared for. And the apostles are like, look, we have to preach the gospel. And, you know, yes. so let's, let's set apart people for that role. And that's, that's where we see that manifestation of the diaconate. It was the deacons then who were ordained to, to care for those people like the, the, the widows and the orphans. And so their ministry was a slight, it was service, but slightly different than the apostolic you know, the, what, what the apostles were doing. So then we kind of see that, that whole dynamic going on in the book of Acts. Well, that's in, in the terms used was serve at table, basically, you know, we become yeah. those types of servants. Um, so ordination, again, like baptism and confirmation leaves an indelible mark mm -hmm. on the soul of the person ordained. So important to note that. And then who can be validly ordained? Um, it'll be baptized and confirmed Catholic men who are called by the church, going back to what we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. The church is calling us forth. Uh, and not and anybody own. who's going through RCIA uh, should be open to, like any male, should be open to the possibility of being called. Yeah. You know, if, if they're already married, um, then that would kind of indicate you know, right now the, the Roman Catholic Church has a discipline of celibate priesthood, um, but if they're feeling some kind of a call, it could possibly be to or, ordained as a permanent deacon. So uh, that's something that would be an ongoing discernment, but if they feel called to it, they probably should talk to you or another deacon sure. at some point in time. But I just want to mention that because just as you, someone mentioned something to you, the Lord may stir in somebody and they need to know where to go with that. So exactly. they should talk to you or the priest or. Yeah. And uh, just to note in my class, uh, there were probably, I'm going to say at least three or four um, men who had converted to the faith. And the only stipulation there is that you are Catholic for five years before you can discern the, the permanent diaconate. So, okay. Yeah. There you go. So then the next one down is the transitional deacon. You're, and I mentioned this earlier, they're ordained to advance through priestly ordination in, in our archdiocese, it's about a, a year. And then the minimum age is 23 years of age at the time of ordination. And lately, I think that's older. The men that are being ordained as priests are slightly older than that. Maybe there are a few in their 20s yet, mm -hmm. but probably most are in their early 30s, I'm guessing. And then the permanent diaconate, our permanent deacon, ordained to remain always as a deacon. The minimum age is 35 years of age at the time of ordination. So you can begin formation approximately when you're age 30, and then ordination would take place about five years later. And you would have to be that, um, that age. And then the maximum age would be 60 years at the time of ordination. And that one, um, there are some rule, flexibility in those rules yeah. in terms of the upper age limit. It, there's a lot of things that go into it, you know, the health of the in, individual, uh, the family dynamics and so forth. So there are different things that the bishop can yeah. look at and, and make that judgment call. And I'm also thinking of St. Therese of Lisieux. She was... Um, she knew she wanted to be a Carmelite nun, and so she actually had to go to the Pope to get permission to go in as a 15-year-old, and yeah. you know, which was earlier than what was allowed. And she ultimately got the permission. So these are 
usually the case, but there are once in a while where you'll have an exception, they'll get special permission. And I'm sure, like you said, the same could hold true for someone if, you know, say someone's going to be 62, right. uh, the church may make an exception. So it all, it just all depends. It's a case by case basis. Yeah. And in the same way on the younger part, on the younger um, yeah. age limit, you know, if, if there was some health condition, you know, whether it be heart or pick something that might be an impediment toward ordination, that would certainly be brought out because we mm -hmm. have to go through a rigorous uh, health evaluation when uh, before we could be called to formation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that second to the last bullet point, if someone who is seeking to be a permanent deacon after they're ordained, they could pursue the priesthood if they were unmarried at the time of their diaconal ordination. So what that means is simply if um, a man is becomes a permanent deacon and he's unmarried at the time, he will take a vow of celibacy at the time of ordination. And then if God's calling, if the church is calling, then he could discern the call to the uh, priesthood. And, um, but that he would have to remain unmarried, obviously. Mm -hmm. And also um, if a deacon is married or someone is like if a person is married and becomes a, a permanent deacon, and if the spouse dies, they cannot remarry as well. Exactly. That's exactly right. But then that last bullet point comes into play where they could pursue the uh, priesthood, priesthood if uh, their wife died. And we actually had a yeah. priest who was ordained this summer uh, who was in that situation. His He was a permanent deacon for, gosh, probably 10 or 15 years. And then his wife died of cancer and he was and they had talked about this him and his wife talked about this before she died as to whether or not he would uh, pursue the priesthood and they both decided that that would be a good thing to do and he was ordained a priest this summer so what a beautiful yeah. thing for him to yeah. okay so uh, now we get maybe a little more specific on terms of the ministries of uh, in this case the deacon so it flows from his sacramental identity, and that goes back to Christ the servant. I would be ordained in the identity of Christ the servant. And sometimes we use the term sacramentalized service, and there's three different things that are listed there. So word, and we talked about this, proclaim the gospel, mm -hmm. preach, teach in the name of the church. So my role is teaching in the name of the church. That's what we're doing right here today. Yeah. We're just using my gifts, if you want to call it that, to pass along to those who are learning. And then sacrament, I am allowed to baptize. I'm allowed to lead the faithful in prayer. So if there's a prayer service like outside of Mass, like on Ash Wednesday coming up this week, um, I would be able to lead a, the faithful in a prayer service. I can't um, do the Mass. I can't preside at a Mass. But then I'm also able to witness marriages outside of mass again, and then also conduct wake and funeral services. Mm -hmm. So both, all of this would be outside of mass, and I would be able to lead uh, those types of prayer services. So the sacraments that I'm able to do are baptism and then witness marriages. Those would be the mm -hmm. two that I'm allowed to do as a deacon. And then charity, lastly, that's where our bishop, and I totally agree with him, that's where he would like to see us permanent deacons uh, emphasize or focus our energy in terms of service to the church. And that's to our charitable ministry. So um, a term that's used in formation is parochia, parochial, which is church or parish. I have parochial ministries here, and then the non-parochial, which would be outside the parish, and that is where the, the bishop is uh, wanting us to make sure we focus our energy. So charity is the word, and then that last bullet point, we're called to radical charity. Mm -hmm. So in my case, my non-parochial ministry is jail and prison, so I go into the prison, uh, well, not now because of COVID, but I typically would go into the prison once a week to teach RCIA to the inmates there. So just to give you a little idea. Yeah. 
And then the, the duties of the deacons from the apostolic constitution. So the, these apostolic constitutions are writings that can be found uh, throughout the um, times of the church. And I, to me, it was a little bit humorous here. We can go through them if we want, but basically they sought out the sick and the poor and then reporting to the bishop upon their needs and, the, and then follow his direction. So again, that serves to the bishop. You know, when we think of being a deacon, we think it's more local to the parish here, but actually it is the bishop that uh, we are called to uh, serve mainly. And certainly the parish has taken on a big part of that, but it's the bishop who uh, we take our orders from. And then uh, back to the comment about serving at table, you know, the, the calling because the the apostles were busy. They couldn't uh, cover or for everything. You know that the church was growing at such a rapid pace. They needed help, and um, that's what they did. Was uh, they created this order of deacons to more better serve the the charitable needs mm -hmm. of the people. And then uh, that last one is where the humor comes in. We become bouncers. In the early days of the church, a deacon was actually more like a bouncer. Uh, the way they held their services, the deacon would guard the, the entrances. And, and this was interesting to me that anyone who was not supposed to be there wasn't allowed in. And, and you had to make that profession of faith to be allowed to partake in the, the sacraments of the church. And I think that uh, so here, here are the people going through RCIA, they're actually in that process of being allowed to partake in the sacraments of the church. Another thing too, I, as far as the guardians of order in the church, I think of uh, even during the mass, the liturgy, where the deacons are kind of, um, you know, uh, telling people to stand when it's time to stand and basically trying to help the liturgy flow properly and, you know, things like that. The whole idea there is to be as invisible as possible, but still assist the priest mm -hmm. in his role. That, that is our duty. When you'll see us at mass, we're not up there as glorified altar boys. You know, we, mm -hmm. our function is to receive the gifts, bring them forward to the priest, and then he will sanctify them. So we become that bridge between the faithful, the lay faithful, and the priest who is going to offer those gifts back to God via the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the diaconal ordination. Now let's talk about priest. And the candidates are called to orders after the proper formation and discernment of their vocation to the priesthood. Uh, back to that whole idea of discernment again, where it's very important. Um, it's not the men who decide whether they're called. It's, it'll be the church that brings them forward. And then who can be validly ordained? Um, anyone who was previous or previously ordained to the transitional diaconate. And then the minimum age is 25 years of age at the time of ordination. So a priest, as soon as they could become a priest, would be age 25. And that's set by canon law. And then there is no upper age limit, and it depends on the diocese. I know there are some dioceses in the United States that have um, priestly formation for older men. And um, I know men who have taken advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're called late in life, and yeah. they want to become a priest. So there's places in the United States that they can go into the seminary formation to become a priest. I met a priest once who was 72, who he was married, had two children. The children, raised the children, they were grown adults and his wife died and he went on to become a priest. He, he wasn't a deacon or anything. He just um, felt called to it. A really great, really great priest. Um, yeah. But also, you know, I wanna just say this again, you know, People in RCIA could be called to the priest at some point in time, uh, remain open to the call. And, you know, they, they might even be in a dating relationship before really embracing that call. And the, the most important thing is to be open to God. The, the fulfillment we seek is in God and, and what God has planned for us. And so that's not always our 
train of thought, but that's the reality. So just as an encouragement to people in RCIA, whatever, whatever year they're watching this, we're making this in 2021, it could be five years from now, who knows? But, um, you know, it, it's important to remain open to God's plan and God's will for our lives. So remain open to potentially being called to discerning that. And um, you just never know, you know, so I just want to put that little plug in there for people to remain open to that. Well, I, I definitely know men who have been in very serious dating relationships. And I think there, I know at least one who was actually engaged at one time. Yeah. And the call was so strong to become a priest that, you know, they, they ended the relationship, you yeah. know, the dating relationship and actually pursued the call. Yeah. The and you have to think too, like if we're talking about God's plan here, and so it's not even just for their own individual that this is the best decision when they come to that, but that the person they're dating, because that means God has a different plan for them as well. And we would be interfering with that plan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, the ultimate God knows what's best. And if we're just, if we trust him, um, he's going to lead us. And so I just want to make that encouragement for God's sake, for the viewer's sake that, it's good to be open to being willing to discern, you know, if God's calling us to that. And, and if he's calling us, you know, he knows what's best, you know, it's, he's got a plan and it's going to be for everyone's best interest. You know, we might not always see it right away. So just wanted to throw that in there. Um, well, I guess uh, to add on to that, if I've learned yeah. one thing, it's not about doing my will, but it's, yeah. it's all about doing God's will. And that's not an easy thing to do. You know, we're, I'll just speak for myself. We tend to be selfish and, um, you know, we tend to push God to the side. And I think what you said is very true that when Yeah, And I, and I am so grateful that I took the time for being open to that and discerning that. Cause, um, you know, if you, if you, even if you have a thought of maybe, and you don't investigate it, you may live with regret, you know, it could be years later and you, you, you're going to be living with the, or you could be living with the, what if, yeah. what if I just looked into it? You know what I mean? Um, you know, it's, it's a good question to have an answer to before you get too far down the road, Absolutely. you know, so it's, it's worth taking a look into. Yes. Uh, so continuing on with priestly ordination, uh, back when I mentioned that a deacon is ordained to Christ the servant, here we have the phrase, and you probably have heard this or will hear it, in persona Christi, and we'll add capitas to that. So we, he acts in the person of Christ the head. So I was ordained to Christ the servant, the identity of, and a priest is ordained to Christ the head. So we're back to that, that whole idea of leadership and governing. Um, this is where that plays in. There's the difference between... Uh, the diaconal ordination and the priestly ordination. And then there's a quote here or a note from the Second Vatican Council on the decree on the ministry of life of priests. And then I'll just read it. Priests as ministers of the sacred mysteries, especially in the sacrifice of the mass, act in a special way in the person of Christ who gave himself as a victim to sanctify men. So that's a... Um, direct quote where that's the reason that these men or are ordained mm. to act in the person of Christ. Okay. So now we have Episcopal ordination again, which is bishops. That's the highest or the fullest level of uh, the sacrament of holy orders. And the men who are called to this, they must be a priest and that least be 35 years of age and then they would be ordained as a successor to the apostles and and we talked about that earlier how each mm -hmm. bishop can trace his ordination back to one of the apostles and we've heard the term apostolic succession and for our separated brothers and sisters of the protestant various protestant groups this is where we start to diverge in our similarities in terms of worship in the sacramental life. That whole apostolic succession was broken 
at the time of Luther because he was not a bishop. He was a priest and he was therefore unable to ordain other men to be priests or bishops. And uh, so we talk about that break in apostolic succession. So I think uh, when we're talking to our separated brothers and sisters, that's one of the ways we can speak to that uh, yeah. in terms of Luther. Another thing too, like when we think about the age requirements, a limit, it has to, or a minimum age, uh, people who are younger in RCIA might not as easily grasp this, but as we get older, you realize that you really do grow in wisdom a lot as you age. And, you know, when I was 24, I thought I had things figured out pretty well. And then when I was 25, I, I had reached a certain level of maturity where I was like, you know what, I really don't have much at all figured out. I, I've got such a long way to go. So, you know, you just, as you grow, you begin to realize things and, you know, each you know, 10 year increment here, we're going from 25 to 35, we can look back, those of us who are beyond those years and think, yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of important growth does take place. A lot of uh, understanding and wisdom can be brought, you know, in those years. So that's why I just mentioned that in case people are wondering why, why age, why a certain level of age, it's, there's a, even a practical component here. Yeah, just think of the immensity of the job, of the yeah. task of leading, you know, a diocese, you know, the, the, the considerations that have to go in and the decisions that need to be made. Um, yeah, you can't take that lightly. So that whole idea of wisdom is yeah. really important. Uh, let's see, we mentioned that uh, the, the priest being ordained to the episcopacy is chosen by the Pope through recommendations. So there's individuals within, in our case, the United States who take recommendations for men to be chosen as a bishop. And then ultimately it will go to the Pope and then he will name the individual who will be, um, who will become a bishop. And obviously the men who are asked to consider they get ultimately make the decision as to whether or not mm -hmm. they. And I, I recall, you know, before I moved here from Pennsylvania, the bishop retired in the diocese I was living in, and they ordained uh, a successor. And it was a they chose a priest from a neighboring diocese. So he was from a different diocese, but still the same state. And um, you know, so I think in that part, they wanted someone familiar with the territory and the people and what culture was like there. And they, they chose a, a priest who was a, a really, really smart canon lawyer type of a guy. Yeah. And, um, and so he'd be, you know, he was, he, was a, he was a really good priest and became our bishop. And that wasn't long before I moved here. And, and so, you know, the point is they, they selected someone from the area. And that doesn't always happen, but uh, the church was trying to have that sense of connectedness for, I think, the people and for the new bishop. You know, they wanted somebody who would would get it, you know, coming right into the role. Yeah, yeah we had that happen within the last year or two, for sure, here in our state. Um, our, our bishop, now Zincula, he was a priest in the Archdiocese of Dubuque. He became the, the Bishop of Davenport. And then uh, second was uh, now Bishop Johnson, who was also a priest in the Archdiocese of Dubuque. He was chosen as the Bishop of Des Moines. So yeah, I totally agree that you know the flock, you kind of know yeah. uh, what's happening already and what a, what a good way to uh, yeah. begin. Okay, and that's about it on that slide. I think we talked about those. Okay. So in previous discussions on sacraments, we talked about matter and form. Uh, each sacrament has a specific matter and form. So in the case of ordination, it's the matter would be the bishop imposing, which means to lay hands on the candidate in, in all cases on their head. And then the form would be the prayer of consecration. And that's different for a priest and a deacon. Um, and then 
the second bullet point there, only a bishop can ordain deacons, priests, and other bishops. So only a bishop can ordain. Uh, they can't delegate to a priest like they can in other sacraments, but they can delegate to another bishop uh, in order to be ordaining men. So then the last one, you'll, we talk about the different vestments that are used for different orders. Um, for myself, you'll sometimes see us in just a stole with, which comes across our shoulder from the left shoulder down to the right side. That would be a sign of a deacon. And then the priest wears his stole over his neck. And that has different meanings in terms of um, uh, meaning in like for service or to lead, to govern type of thing. And, and then the titles you'll talk about, you know, we talk about monsignors, uh, cardinals, all those things are titles that are given. They're not necessarily that you're just ordained into the, the priestly or the uh, episcopacy, you know, those roles and the titles go with that. And this is more towards priests. And that's about all I have in terms of the, the slide presentation, but I'm sure there's a lot more we can talk about. Yeah, you know, I, I jotted uh, two things down that some of our people may be questioning. And the first one, I wanted to address the topic of married priests because it's a cultural thing that gets brought up. And, um, you know, so just to clarify, in the Roman Catholic rite, which what we're practicing here, it's a discipline for priests to not get married. It's not something that, um, you know, God said priests have to be celibate, but the church instituted it as a discipline. And there's scriptural basis for that, which we could, we could talk at, we could even talk about it at our gathering when we get together as a class. But, um, there are also Catholic rites, like Eastern Catholic rites, that do have married priests. So they don't observe it as a discipline, the celibate priesthood. So um, I also think that the Pope had an inve investigation done as far as allowing married priests in certain regions where the, the, the number of priests to serve was so dismal that they, were, they have to consider something, you know. Um, and I wanted to bring it up for a couple reasons. One, just to talk about it, but two, so I don't want people to get scandalized if, if, if the church ever modified that um, discipline. Um, it's not something that is an absolute requirement as far as like a dogmatic thing. So for instance, we're called to believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. That's a dogmatic teaching of the church. Whether or not a priest is married or not isn't one of those levels of church teaching. So, um, Deacon Des, what are your thoughts then that you would share with the group? Yeah, I agree with you on that. And so, to, to your point, in our Roman or the Latin Rite Church, um, there are married priests. And yeah. some of those in that would, you'll see that. And I guess I know one. And the way that came about is they were Protestant ministers and the, they were married at the time. And when they converted to Catholicism, they wanted to continue in the role as a priest. So again, now the bishop is involved and through discernment and that call of the church, they were allowed to go through formation and become a Catholic priest, and they were allowed to be married. So there's a handful in the United yeah. States that are like that. So it's not something that doesn't exist. Right. And we talk about large T, small T tradition. So, um, you know, this is one of those traditions that mm -hmm. could be changed. Yeah. And, you know, you bring that up, it reminds me, one of those individuals, there's very few in the country in the Latin rite, but one of them actually I was in the parish that I came from, from Pennsylvania. It's a small rural area of Pennsylvania. I mean, we had 300 families, but he was, a, I believe, a Presbyterian, maybe a minister. I forget exactly what, because he was, he actually bounced around different 
faiths in his journey to Catholicism. He was getting closer to a liturgical type of church, and then eventually he came to the fullness um, in the Catholic Church. Married, he had like five children at the time. It probably has more now. But um, he applied for special permission from the bishop and eventually got it. Took him a few years. He actually um, was there for a few years in ministry in the diocese before they allowed him to start seminary. And I moved to Iowa, you know, while he was probably three quarters of the way through his seminary training. And so, um, or actually, no, he was just finishing it. But as far as when he would be ordained, the, the bishop wasn't anxious to make the ordination. He was taking his good old time with it because, you know, it's not something common and he didn't want to ruffle feathers and, um, you know, so it's a delicate thing. Now, and, I know uh, you did say one thing about the Eastern Rite churches where they do allow married priests. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things to note there is that the bishops must be unmarried. They must be celibate. So in order to mm -hmm. become a bishop, you yeah. must be unmarried. And so yeah. that, you know, there again, you know, we're talking about the differences within the different rites of the church, but definitely uh, there is this element. And I think it's practical and spiritually good for the church. You yeah. Know, uh, I'll just use myself as an example. I'm married and I have two children. I mean, it is stress on a marriage to be called. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing this, you're balancing things out in terms of your service. You know, my wife and children, they are my first vocation. And the, and this is what we were trained, you know, to know and believe and that our diaconal ordination was second, but still it, it becomes uh, a point of uh, stress, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. divided, you know, in your terms of service, mm -hmm. whether you're serving the church or your family. So yeah. it's very practical, at least I think. Yeah. The wisdom of the church again. I think yeah. And, um, you know, another thing too, Jesus says in the gospel, when it comes to the priesthood, he said, there are those who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept it should accept it. So it's not um, that they have to, in a sense, but they should. So just, again, bringing the words of Jesus into the discussion that it's, even, in, even for God, it's a preference in that regard that someone remains celibate. But, you know, it he gives a little room in that sentence there, the way he words it. And the church in some, to some capacity has a lot of, and I'm also thinking about the Anglican Catholic church. So the Anglican church broke away from the Catholic church in England. And um, there has been a movement back to the faith. And there have been entire parishes, Anglican parishes that have become Catholic with their priests or even you know, with their bishop, you know, and so the church has embraced them and welcomed them. And again, their, their priests were, that were married have been allowed to become ordained Catholic Anglican priests. Uh, and they've actually set up a, a unique diocese. Is that the whole country of the United States is the Anglican diocese, is, is a diocese with a bishop, an Anglican bishop. Yes. And, um, I think, and, I, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I think at some point the church is going to have to like step back and say, what are we saying here? You know, you can grow up outside of the church and become a married priest, but you can't grow up inside. I mean, that's yeah. not the strongest message. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree. Now, one of the things in the what you're referring to, I think the term is, it's called an ordinariate. So yeah. any, of, any of those congregations that were coming into the Catholic Church and retaining all their, uh, you know, Anglican, uh, what you want to call it, the, the rites, you know, the, the sacraments and all that, the things that went with it, if the priest at the time, if they come in through this ordinary process, they do remain uh, celibate. They cannot uh, get married after right. the fact, but if they right. are, when right. they're allowed, obviously, to stay yeah. if they come yeah. in and they're 
not married, then they would remain celibate. After. Yeah, and and to get back to your point too is some practicality. I have four little children, and um, it's it is tough. Like I I'm a my job is 40 hours. It's on, on paper, it says 40 hours a week. And I often go over a little bit, but I usually draw the line, you know, like when we get to be getting close to 45, I just, that's it. I'm, I mean, even if there's emails coming in, I'm, I'll answer them on Monday. You know, I just, I have to give this time to my family because they need that. But with a priest, you don't necessarily have that option you know if a call comes in from a hospital like if i'm a priest and i have four little kids and a call comes in of a dying person in the hospital and i'm the only person who can go give last rites or something well i gotta go you know um you know so if it's my child's birthday party and i've got to go you know that's that's tough on the family so uh again there is good reason for it and it's preferred it, you know, the celibacy aspect is preferred, even looking at the words of Jesus. So, um, you know, this is a dynamic, and, and I think it's it's good for us to address it, because um, the church is filled with people. You know, it's people and lives, and so you have to hold firm to the dogmatic teachings as far as this is what we place our faith in, the fact that Jesus is in the Eucharist, the fact that God is a trinity, Mary is the mother of God, she remained a virgin. All of these dogmatic teachings we've talked about, that's what we place our faith in. Now, as far as the practice of living out certain aspects, we need to have flexibility with the church. You know, like if the church allows a married priest in your parish at some point in time, well, the, the church allowed it. And so we roll with it. We don't, you know, it, for me, it wouldn't be like, oh, I got to leave because this isn't, you know, I, you know. Um, and so this is a good conversation and people coming into the faith need to recognize there's, there is a dynamic here. The most important thing is hold on to those defined teachings. And when the church has some flex in the way it practices things, we got to flex with it, you know. And just, you know, one last note on that, you know, one of the highest divorce rates um, is among non-Catholic pastors, you know, because if you look in to the Protestant denominations, the, the people who are married, the ministers who are married, there's a very high divorce rate there. And I think that speaks to what we're talking about here. Yeah. That, that it's so easy to become divided yeah. uh, just through what, what, whatever vocation we're being called to. Yeah. So it's tough, you know, and I think the church, there's a lot of pressure uh, on the church to mm -hmm. change some of this stuff. But I think that's where, again, where the wisdom comes in of the people. Of yeah. the and now I, you know, I, I want to be mindful of our time. I just want to address one other question here as far as women priests. So you, you see that in other denominations, women becoming priests, uh, according to, you know, their, um, and you will not see that in the Catholic church. And that's not something that will change. It's not something like we were talking about the possibility of a married priest ending up in your parish well, you won't see a woman priest in your parish because of the understanding of the priesthood in the Catholic Church. First and foremost, the priest, as Deacon, you said, stands in persona Christi. Jesus is a man. And so we do not have gender confusion in that regard. Um, and so the person standing as a man, as a representation of the man, is a man. Now, Jesus could have picked his own mother to be one of the apostles, who better to pick, but he did not. Exactly. He chose 12 men, and that's very, there's a specific reason for that. So with God, there, there is a specific role for gender. So like, I can't, I can't physically give birth to a child because that's not part of God's plan for me. And that, that same concept actually goes with what we're talking about. Exactly. God's plan with the priesthood is a male role because that's the way he instituted it. You know, if he wanted to institute women as well, I mean, who did he pick to be the first at the grave? Was Mary Magdalene. The women found him first or found that went to the tomb first. It wasn't the apostles. They all have their role. But when it comes to the ministry of the ordained priesthood, it's God's it's God's plan that it's a male role. And so you will not see that in the Catholic church.
And so, you know, and along with that, to me, there's this, and it's not just to me, I think this is, again, the, the vision of the church. There's a spousal connotation there where, yeah. the, you know, a priest in the person of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ. So, again, we're, we're, we have that yeah. marriage element there that I don't think can be ignored because I, yeah. I tell people it's ontologically impossible for a woman to become a priest just because of that spousal yeah. identity that goes along with uh, becoming a priest. And then uh, in a sense, yeah. the church becomes his bride. And yeah. I don't think we can go down that path. And I, um, and there's yeah. a, you know, a lot to be understood there, but definitely yeah. think that this whole idea of marriage and the spousal yeah. communication. Again. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the role of a, a man in, in a marriage is different than the role of a woman. And so when you talk about Jesus and his church, the bride, like Jesus's role in relation to what he gives to the church is different than the church is receiving that. Exactly. Like a, a, a wife receives the gift of her husband and can bring forth life, which is a child. The husband gives to the wife. And so Jesus gives to us we receive that and we bring forth the life of a Christian, the life of Christ. So there is a, is that spousal dynamic there that I'm so glad you brought that in because it is so important. And again, the church is the bride of Christ, as scripture tells us. The, the scriptures is the revealed word of God. This is what God is telling us. And so that needs to be definitely observed. So yeah. that's and a great point. The term equality being used a lot. And my response to that, you know, the equality of men and women in the church, and my response to that is equality does not mean sameness. You know, yeah. man and a woman are not the same. We're equal in our dignity and in our gifts. We're, we're equal without a mm -hmm. doubt. It's not the same. Um, so when, and that's the, the way we would look at yeah. the ordination to the priesthood. Um, yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time. I, um, this is this has been a great uh, discussion as well, and um, I think we hit on some important points there at the end too, because that's stuff we hear about in the world yeah. today. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, how about you? You close us in a prayer, Deacon Dennis. I would love to do that. So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of our church, and we give you thanks for the gift of ordination. And Lord, we just pray that as time goes on, that the men who are being called into holy orders will respond generously to that call and go through the process of discernment to see whether they truly are being called to be a priest or a deacon in our diocese and throughout the world. So Lord, we call on our spiritual father, St. Joseph, as we end our time together and pray that he will intercede for those men being called. And we pray all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Deacon Dennis. Thank you so much, Take John. care. God bless you. God bless.